name is Blessings and my life is a miracle. The place where I came from is in the middle of nowhere. It's about eight hours from the city and about four hours to the nearest hospital. I lived in a village that was surrounded by hills and life was just in this village. And coming out of this village was by the grace of God because what I knew was nothing else apart from this small world. My friends and my family still lives there, but for some reason, God chose me, and that's why I'm here today. While I was in school, a preacher shared with me the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time. It was really hard for me to get it and understand it. The reason being, my dad was an alcoholic, and that made it really difficult for me to understand what the love of God was all about. But one day I came across a verse, my beautiful verse, the verse of my heart, John 3, verse 16. And God spoke to me through this verse and completely changed my life and completely transformed me. After meeting that preacher and doing well in school, God gave me the grace to come out of this village and had the privilege of attending African Bible College. And it was at African Bible College where I was given the tools to be able to give back uh, to my community. Today, with my friends, we run an organization called Live Love. And we seek to help the least of this. And we do this by offering a set of holistic services to the villagers around. So we run mobile clinics and we help girls stay in school long and we also do sports program. And all this is done alongside spiritual development. My life is a miracle. And my going life is to see similar transformation brought to the people of Malawi, the people who are just like me. Will you help me transform Malawi? So every time Blessings and I are together, at some point in the conversation, generally I interrupt him and I just stop and I look at him and I just say, my name is Blessings Chibambo and my life is a miracle. And if anybody else is in the room with me, they always add that is a miracle. And we all say at the same time. And I think if we're honest, if we think about that statement, I think we'd all love to have that said about our lives or our stories that our life is a miracle. Every year around this time for our Serve the World Month, I have people come up to me and say, Paul, I would love to go to Liberia with you, or Malawi with you, or Haiti with you, but you don't understand, it would take a miracle for me to get there. And my response is generally the same. I stop and I look at them and I say, well, then maybe you should pray for a miracle. You see, when you pray for a miracle, things begin to happen. Your lives begin to shift. As Palmer and I were talking through uh, this month and what we're looking at and, and what we're just kind of going through, one of the statements that he said is that firsthand experiences spark your justice calling. Those firsthand experiences, those things that you live through, not the things you hear, but the things that you're a part of, maybe the miracles that you live through. Over the last probably 10 to 15 years, I've, I've come to realize that one of my callings in life is to bring people from first world communities, places like America, Australia, Europe, bringing those people from first world communities to third world countries and bringing them there and walking through life with them in villages, in the jungles, in the places of Africa, in the slums of Haiti or in the, in the red light districts of Thailand. Because what I get the joy of seeing is seeing people that come in with an agenda, with a feeling of we're coming here to help and to change and, and to make this world a better place and realize as they get there that it's like they hit a wall and they see the joy and the beauty all around them. And it's as if we stop and step back and realize I'm standing in the midst of a miracle. And so then they go home and I watch as their lives just get flipped over the last probably 10 years, I've had the blessing of bringing over a thousand of you to countries around the world. And what I've watched is I've watched that transformation happen in this church because you are going out and seeing and being a part of the world, but then going back to these places. And it's changed who we are here at the Grove. 
As a missionary kid, oftentimes when I hear Palmer sharing stories, I relive some of my own stories. Last week, as he was sharing the story of his uncle, who wasn't really his uncle, but was his dorm parent, was on the side of the road and helped this lady who had been hit by a car and how a black Mercedes pulled over and eventually uh, put them in the back of the car and helped her get to safety. As I was sitting up there, I was reliving when I was in seventh grade. I was at Dalat School in Penang, Malaysia. I asked my uncle Gordon, who wasn't really my uncle, but was my dorm parent. I said, can the seventh and eighth grade boys go swimming at the pool? And he says, will there be any girls present? Because apparently that's a sin. I said, no, it will just be us blessed humans. We will go by ourselves, thank you. He says, yes, you may go. So we went down to the pool and we're playing. And after a while, we climbed up on the wall that surrounded our school. And we're sitting there. And behind us is this busy road. All of a sudden, we hear this crash behind us. And we turn around. And this black BMW had ran into this old man on a moped. And I remember as the man jumped out of the BMW and people came running across the street. And they quickly, they picked him up. And I'll never forget the image of them picking him up in his entire calf hanging off his leg. And as a seventh grade boy, that image will never leave my head. And I remember they opened up the back door, and I just remember like it was yesterday, the perfect white leather interior of this seemingly brand new black BMW car. And I remember as they put him in, there was just red smears all over the door and the back seat, and instantly the back seat became filled with blood. They closed the door, and they drove away. And that moment sticks in my brain. And it doesn't haunt me, but it's a memory that I continually come back to. You see, when we went to boarding schools as kids, as missionary kids back in the 70s and 80s, every year you'd categorize people. You'd want to know who they are. Are they a bush missionary or are they a city missionary? That may not sound different to you, but the bush missionaries grew up in the jungles. They came from the remote places. To put it in our language, they were crazy. And then the city missionaries kind of had this street smarts to them, but the bush missionaries, you knew you just got to stay back away from them a little bit because they could kill you. (laughs) Palmer grew up in the bush of Liberia. (laughs) I'm just saying. There was a kid in my school that was from the jungles of Irian Jaya. His name was Dan Wisely. He spent his entire life living with a remote village that the only way to get there was through this teeny little landing strip. And every year he'd come to school. There was one year he came to school barefoot and he literally had sticks sticking out of his feet. And we're like, what's going on? He goes, I was playing football. I'm like, why don't you take that out? Ah, the nurse is going to take it out later. I mean, it was just a completely different level of thinking. I remember Dan one day, we used to play this game. This is how you know a missionary kid. We would stand facing each other. You take a knife and you throw it in the ground. Wherever it sticks, you move your foot. And then you keep moving. And whoever moves their foot first loses. We could get to the point where we were literally a half inch away and still throw it and stick it in between. Dan wisely would play every now and then, but nobody would play with him because he would never move his feet. And I remember one day I watched Dan was getting ready to play. He was in his short shorts from the 80s, no shirt, no shoes, and he's eating an apple. And I watch, he's playing this kid from a city, which you're going to lose, and Dan keeps moving his feet, and he keeps moving his feet, and he gets to the point where there's about a half inch away. And the other kid had it at the same distance. Dan just went, stuck it right in between, no problem. The kid takes it up, Dan takes a bite of his apple. The guy throws the knife and sticks it right in the top of Dan's foot. Dan looks down, takes another bite of his apple, looks at the guy, goes, you lose. (laughs) Bends over, pulls the knife out of his foot, and just carries on. That's the world we lived in. But those kids were also exposed to more violence more suffering, more danger. And so we would come together each year at our boarding schools and share these stories. And now 20, 30, 40 years later, those stories still come back. They still seep deeply into our souls. And it's something that you can't leave. I was having a conversation uh, this last week with Ali Sesmat, who works with our fifth and sixth graders, and Shelby Soros, who works with our kids And Allie said to me, she said, Paul, I wish I could take all of those stories, all of that violence that you've seen, I wish I could take that away from you. And Shelby looked at me and she goes, I don't. I hope that stays inside of you the rest of your life. And I just kind of looked at Shelby like, what are you thinking? She goes, it's what makes you you. It's shaped you. It's molded you. 
You know, as we come together during this month and we talk about missions, the questions that I get from people that maybe are passing through our congregation, they ask the question is, why is the Grove so focused on missions? Why does Palmer always speak on justice? Why do you guys have an entire month dedicated to serve the world instead of just a week like most churches? Why are you so focused on the world? Well, it's because of what we've seen. You see, I believe that all of our faith is shaped by our experiences, the things that we've lived through. And the things that you see shape your heart. It shapes who you are. And if you're just living in a place where you're putting kind of your struggles and the things, your sufferings, the things that you've lived through over here and then saying, this is my faith, well, those two worlds never meet and you're missing the full blessing of what God has called us to do and how he's called us to live There's a saying that I've been wrestling through lately. It's just simply this. What you see is what you get. There's those people that you meet that that before you introduce, somebody whispers, hey, they're they're a what you see is what you get person. So just so you know. I actually like those people because you don't ever have to wonder where where you're standing because they just kind of blurt it all out all the time. Now, when you're renting a room or you're getting a hotel and you go and you see really small, what you see is what you get, that's the wrong place to stay. (laughs) go someplace else, or you're buying a car, you're getting ready to sign the papers, and it says, what you see is what you get. Wait a minute. That means you could drive a mile, maybe two, maybe five, but the thing's gonna break instantly. Walk away. But as I look at this statement in regards to our faith, I've really began to process through, it's like, what if this is two different statements? What you see is what you get. The C, I circled that, and I think about that idea of what you and I see, the things that we live through, the experiences that we go through, those first-hand interactions, the things where our hands are bloody or dirty, the moments where we're down on our knees, seeping, crying, weeping, and struggling through these issues, those things that you've experienced, not the stories you've heard, all of those things that you see determines what you get determines what you become, determines who you are. Jesus was always speaking when they asked him, what is the most important commandment? Deuteronomy 6, he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your body, your soul. You see, when I go to places like Malawi and Liberia and Haiti and I go back and I go back and I go back, there's relationships that I form that, that form and shape my heart. There's experiences that I live through that bother me. And when they bother me, I'm forced to process those things with my mind. And I wrestle with, how can I live through this? How can I bring hope? How can I effectively walk through life with people? And then I have to choose with my body. Am I going to physically step into this? Am I going to go back to this place that maybe brought fear? Am I willing to step into these journeys that we do around the world? Or am I going to stay here safe, sitting at home? Ultimately, all of that shapes your soul. It's called a lived theology, meaning the things that you live through directly impact how you view God, how you view your relationship with Jesus. All of those things come together and who are you? What is your faith about As a missionary kid, one of the statements I heard all the time is we're here to preach the Great Commission. The Great Commission over and over again. The Great Commission was the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And I heard it and I heard it and I heard it. And eventually at some point I had to stop and ask, what would it be like to be living in that place when Jesus is telling his disciples and his followers, go into all the world and preach the gospel? So I started placing myself in this story. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 32, it's before his death, it's before he was crucified, he's walking with his followers, his disciples, the people are all around him, and it's just, just, Jesus stops and he just says, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. There wasn't really much context for when he said that, so I imagine all the disciples just kind of stepping back, looking at each other and saying, does anyone know what he's talking about? After I have risen, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee. What's he rising from? What's he talking about? What's in Galilee? Why are we going there? But no one is bold enough to ask the question, so they just kind of continue. Fast forward, Jesus has been crucified. It's the third day. 
Mary, Mary, and the women are running to the tomb on the third morning. And it says, an angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. You see, when Jesus ever is telling somebody to go someplace, or when God is writing, talking about that in the Old Testament, go here, he always says, do not be afraid. The angel says to them, go quickly and tell them that Jesus has gone ahead of you. He's waiting for you in Galilee. So the women turn, and I picture them running, running to where the disciples are. And it says, they hurried away from the tomb, tomb afraid, yet filled with joy. That describes every mission trip ever. I'm scared out of my mind, and I'm filled with joy. And they run, ran to tell the disciples, and suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said, as you do when you rise from the dead. They came to him, clasped his feet, meaning they physically touched him, and they worshiped him. And then Jesus said, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. When's the last time as you were stepping into your faith, you had to tell yourself, okay, don't be afraid. You see, we live in this place of safety, of security, of comfort, and yet Jesus is saying, go, and do not be afraid. It goes on in Matthew 28, verse 16. It says, meanwhile, the 11 disciples were on the way to Galilee. They, they figured out the message, and they're walking to Galilee, headed for the mountain Jesus had set for the reunion The moment they saw him, they worshiped him. And wouldn't it be amazing if the paragraph ended there, but it says, some, though, held back. Not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. You see, that statement right there, some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally, has continued on for centuries and centuries from churches to people over and over and over again. And for some reason, there's this thing inside of us that says, just kind of step back. I'm not really sure about worship. I'm not really sure about risking myself completely. And then went on to say, Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all that I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. There were those that stepped back in fear, afraid to give themselves completely. And then Jesus says, go out into all the world, far and near, day after day after day. You see, oftentimes we look at missions or this calling to go as this experience of I'm leaving for a week or two and then I'm coming back to my home, to my place of security and safety, and maybe someday again I'll go back. In reality, Jesus says, go into all the world, far and near, day after day after day, meaning there's no exit strategy. Oftentimes, missions organizations will go in and say, we're gonna serve this community for 5.6 years, and then we're gonna train them up to do this themselves, and then we're gonna leave. But you don't leave family. And one of the things that we try to do here at The Grove is to step into the communities that we partner with and go through life together. You know, one of the best missions trips that I was ever on It was about 10 years ago in Malawi. I sat down with the chief, his name is Chimpampa, and blessings, and we talked through life. We talked through what was life like in their community. He took me around and introduced me to all the leaders. He took me to the school. He introduced me to all the chiefs. He brought together the community committees that led his, his village. He brought me from hut to hut to hut and introduced me. And over the years, I've had the opportunity to get to know this guy. One year, I gave him a Bible. The next year, I came back. It was all marked up. He was talking to me about Jesus, and he says, the church won't let me go because I have three wives. What should I do? Pick three churches and just take one to each each week? I don't don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know what you do. (laughs) It's probably bad advice. But I watched this man... This Guliwankulu witch doctor, 
I watched him open his heart up to me. And we can talk now, and he'll say things, and I don't speak Chichewa, but I know what he's saying, and so I'll answer his question, and they'll look at me and say, how do you know what he says? Because I know his heart. Like, I know his intentions. And this man opened up his community, and we were able to dream on what it could look like. And 10 years later, we sit and we look back, and everything that he talked about, we have accomplished. Not us, but we. Everyone in his village, and it's this amazing partnership. One of the worst mission trips I ever went on was a couple years later, we went into that same community and handed out all kinds of stuff but what that created was riots and people wanting free stuff. And it, it was this horrible experience of people jumping over each other to get the stuff that we were handing out. And we made a vow, we're, we're never going to do that again. And it took a couple years to get over that. You see, when Jesus says, therefore, go, it's actually a statement that means, as you are going. We look at it oftentimes as, I need to go to this place and then come back. But the commandment is, therefore, go. So as you are going, day after day after day, wherever you are out, it is continual with the people that you are with in that moment. Not this two-week tr trip, but a life journey. He said, go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life. Palmer and I stole a phrase from an author, and it's, he said it's called glocal, meaning go globally and locally. Whatever you're doing globally around the world, do the exact same thing in your communities. Too often, we see someone doing an amazing work, and we think to ourselves, I wish I could do something like that, but I, I just don't have those gifts, so I'm just going to stand behind them and, and pray for them and maybe write them a check. And so we put this ownership on other people. Well, that happens when we're not realizing that God is saying to all of us, go into all of the world, far and near, each and every single one of you. G.K. Chesterton was an amazing author. Uh, he was asked to write an article for the London Times. He was asked to write an article, and it was simply titled, What's Wrong with the World? A couple weeks later, they asked him for the article, so he sent it in, they opened it up, and it said, Dear Sirs, I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. And that was the entire article. In other words, he was taking the ownership upon himself, realizing there was so much more than each and every single one of us can do. Some held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. When I was 32, I felt just being led to move overseas, and so I was looking at moving to Guatemala and I was talking to the people that were bringing me there, and I said, you know, I have two young kids. I don't, I'm not sure if maybe this is the wrong time. And he asked me, he said, where'd you grow up? I said, well, Thailand and Malaysia. He's like, how many countries were you in before high school? And I said, 20 to 25. He says, would you change any of that? I said, no, that was the greatest blessing my parents ever gave me. I wouldn't change one moment of it. And he said, then why aren't you willing to bring your kids to Guatemala? And as I processed it, I realized I was afraid that, like, what if we got sick? Or what if we got robbed? Or, or what if something, like, even worse happened? And then I realized this was all rooted in my fear. Like, I was afraid to step into that. That statement, what you see is what you get. I didn't want to see those things because I was afraid of what would happen to not only me, but to my family and those all around me. You see, when you don't step into God's guidance, you miss his blessings completely. And going there was one of the greatest things that I did in my life and being able to bring that memories to my children and passing that on. We're called to go into all the world. And when we go into all the world, it starts right here. Next week, we're handing out Thanksgiving boxes. It's an opportunity to bring a small blessing into a family's house. This last week, I was sitting down with our community leaders, downtown Chandler, and one of them said to me, she's a what you see is what you get person. She said, Paul, every year you guys come and you bring these blocks, boxes, but sometimes people just drop off the box and leave. I said, what do you want us to do? She says, I want you to sit and talk with them. I want you to get to know our names. Our, I want you to understand that we're the same just because you guys come from the other side of the 202. 
I said, what do you mean? And we talked about how the 202 has become our other side of the tracks. And every community in history has had those places where, oh, that's over there. And we never address it, and we just kind of go through life. But it's a true statement. I can live in my comfort, in my beauty, in my, in my home, in my safety, in my security. Or I can go to the other side of the world by driving three miles and be willing to sit with a family. And so she just simply said, know our people's names. Sit with them. Talk with them. Next Saturday, we have our monthly service event. Every single month we do this where we go downtown and you can come and you can mow a lawn and you can feel good and you can go about your day. But the idea of that is you mow this person's lawn and the next month, you're with that same family and the next month, you're with that same family. And I could care less if you mow the lawn or not, but if you're sitting down with them and talking and getting to know their names and now you're going through life with, me, with them, one of my greatest relationships in my life was this homeless guy that just kept coming in and out of my life. You know, when you sit down with people that look differently than you, that have different stories than you, that have different agendas, different backgrounds, different everything, it changes who you are at your core. When he says, go and make disciples, you can't make a disciple unless you know them, unless you're sitting with them, unless you're going through life with them. That's how you make a disciple because what you see is what you get. So what I see means I have to be with them and they need to be with me because just as much as I need them, they need me. Neither one of those is greater. In James chapter one, verse 22, it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So the teaching to go into all the world is scary, it's frightening, it begins here. But I do not want to be stuck in that group where it says that some though held back. They weren't sure about worship. They weren't sure about risking themselves totally. You know, when I talk about mission trips or these journeys that we go on, oftentimes I have people come up to me and say, I I'd love to go with you, but I'm too old. My dad climbed a volcano with me in Guatemala when he was 70 for his 70th birthday. I had to pull him up half the mountain. There was lava flowing literally around us and we kept, he kept saying, keep marching. <laughs> he was pretty sore for a couple of weeks, but he did it. When he was 75, he was asked to go to Iraq to train pastors in the back of a van as they drove around Baghdad. He did it. He was sick for a week after he got back. When he turned 80, he went to Malawi with me and he sat with Chimpampa underneath the same tree and had conversations about life and answered him some of his questions about three wives. <laughs> and at the end of that time, Chimpampa looked at me, he says, thank you for bringing your elders. Thank you for bringing your dad. I said, he said, thank you for bringing the leader. I said, no, actually, I'm the leader. He's just old. <laughs> he says, no, he's, he's the leader. Another excuse I get is I can't go because we're too young. I had a five and a six year old that out raised their parents one year. They went to Malawi and they went door to door raising money. Now, if a five year old comes to your door and says, I'm going to Malawi, will you give me $20? It's an automatic, here you go. Com they could be completely lying to you, you're still giving them the $20. I also had the village say, thank you so much for bringing your children. Every single year that I'm there, I also have the people in the village saying, where's so-and-so? Why didn't they come back? Where's that kid? That kid was fun. They killed my chicken, but they were fun. <laughs> One of the main excuses I get is, I would love to go, but I financially, there's no way I could raise that type of money. And then I take that five-year-old kid and I said, I'd like to introduce you to this kid because she raised the money and you're saying that you can't and yet a five-year-old can. It puts it in perspective. Is it scary? Absolutely. I think one of the biggest things that prevents us from going downtown around the world is fear. I've gone over 200 trips in the last 10 or 11 years. 
every single trip I go on, every single one, I deal with anxiety and fear, and I'm afraid of certain things. I went to Australia a couple weeks ago, safest place in the world. It was so hard for me to leave home. There was just this fear that gripped me. It's crazy. I remember I was in Haiti after our, on our second trip. The first trip, we were in the aftershocks. I saw a lot of this stuff firsthand. And that first night in, in Haiti on that second trip, they have us staying in a five-story building. And I'm on the second or third floor. And on my previous trip, I had seen five-story buildings that were reduced to 10 feet. So as I'm walking to my room, I'm literally thinking, I am going to die tonight. And it wasn't a thing of comedy and funny and joking. I literally thought that was my last night on earth. And I was thinking, how can I get a message to my wife that I love her? Because I'm not coming back from this. We get into our room and we're getting ready for bed and there was two other guys and there's one bed. And I said, you guys can sleep on the bed. I'm going to sleep on the ground. Why? Oh, no, you, it's fine. <laughs> I pull the uh, dresser away from the wall and I slid in between it, and so I had about a foot and a half that I was sleeping. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, it's just fun. <laughs> in my mind, I was thinking, this building's falling down, and I have a wall and a dresser that will give me a little bit of a chance to survive. And that's how I went to sleep. Going into all the world is scary. There's going to be moment after moment after moment where you will be gripped with fear. And yet Jesus says, go. Like, go into all the world. Go into these places. I remember for me, recently I was with Champampa, and we were sitting and I was talking with him. And, and here's a picture of him. And as I was sitting and talking, we were dreaming and thinking back over the last 10 years ago. And about a month ago, I got a message and it says, Champampa just passed away. He passed away from diabetes. And honestly, if he would have lived here in America, he would have lived for another 20 or 30 years, easily. And yet because of where he was born, in that community, our lives passed, passed for a season. But then he left. And I processed through that. That, that was so difficult for me to realize that why, why did this have to happen? You see, we're called to go into all the world, and we have relationships with people like that, and it changes us. And then what happens is, is we're called to then step into these places over and over and over again. In Isaiah 41, verse 10, it says this. It says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Jesus calls us to go. And we see there's two different stories there. There are those people that stepped into the story and there are those people that stepped back and said, I'm just afraid to risk. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be as dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Some of the greatest movements in history have started because one person stood up and they said, I am willing to step into this and I don't know what will happen, but I'm stepping in. If you could stand where you are right now. I remember when I was a seventh grade kid at the boarding school, we had a speaker that said, if you're willing to step into this great commission, this calling to God, Go, not knowing what that means, not knowing where you're going, but to trust that God is leading you. He said, then come forward. And I remember it was like God just picked me up and moved me to the front of the room. And I stood there and just realized, well, it's too late because I already came up. So let's just figure this out. We're gonna sing a song and it simply says this. It says, a miracle can happen now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. And we look at people like blessings and we say, well, his life's a miracle, but I'm pretty sure the calling is for every single person in this room. You just have to move.